Hi, everybody, and welcome to another Steady Horse Live. Um, super excited to get with everybody again this week. I always look forward to these Steady Horse Lives because this is an opportunity to go over any questions that folks might have as usual. I like to start with um, some of the emails that I get uh, through Facebook Messenger, from club members, that kind of thing. And I like to start with a handful of those um, and uh, then take some of the questions that you guys post on here today. Um, please don't forget, as you jump on, go ahead and say hello, say where you're from. Um, that way I can say hi back to you as best as I possibly can. And as usual, at the very end of the Steady Horse Live today, we are going to be doing another giveaway. So uh, super excited about that. We're going to be giving a I Heart My Steady Horse t-shirt, and uh, um, people seem to be loving those so far. So super excited about um, being able to, to give out that giveaway um, for the winner of that. Um, and again, don't forget, as you jump on here, say hello. Tell us uh, where you're from, and I look forward to all the questions uh, that you have. So as you have a question, just throw it down in the uh, Facebook chat here. And as usual, Peter will be throwing it up on the screen over here for me. Uh, that way I can see your questions. Again, I can't always get to all of them, but I will certainly try my best. Awesome, awesome. Okay, and I see some of y'all um, uh, jumping on in here. I see we've got uh, uh, Deborah Russell from Tennessee. Uh, Stacy from East Texas, welcome. You got uh, Celeste from uh, Indiana, and I see. Um, let's see there, Christina uh, from Texas as well. Howdy, Christina. We got uh, Ransom jumping on. Uh, Leanne Alliger, good evening, Leanne. Good to see you. And uh, Stacy from Pennsylvania, awesome, awesome. Glad everyone's kind of jumping in here and um, helping us to get the ball rolling and get started here. So I'm going to go ahead and jump. Oh, and then also, let's see, uh, Michelle from Florida. Can't leave you out, Michelle. Glad you could join us. So I'm going to go ahead and um, get started with uh, some of the member questions that have come through. And like I said, once we uh, tackle a few of these, then we'll go ahead and we'll jump into the questions that you guys have this evening. So let's see. Uh, Jessica says, I'm starting a two-year-old and she is wanting to stick her nose out when I ask her to stop. I've been working on flexing and she does well on the ground, but when I'm in the saddle, it changes. I know I'm just missing something. Thank you for your help. Okay, so um, so she says she has a horse that's sticking its nose out. Um, and a horse might do that for a number of, of reasons. But typically, the number one reason why a horse just kind of roots their, their nose down is that horse is telling you something. And typically what that horse is saying is, hey, can you loosen up those reins a little bit? Give me a little bit of room. Uh, sometimes, in fact, a lot of times, without realizing it, we have a lot more pressure in our horse's mouth than we realize. And horses are smart, so they figure, hey, you know, if I feel like he or she or whoever this person is in my mouth is hanging on my mouth, well, if I root my, my mouth forward, I'm gonna be able to release that pressure because inevitably when your horse does that, they're kind of yanking those lines out of your hand. So the number one thing first is make sure, I mean, make sure you're being very reasonable with your give, right? You draw that horse to a stop, take a deep breath, but then release your hands. Make sure you're not just holding on and never giving that horse a release because if you don't release, then your horse doesn't understand that they've done the right thing by stopping, okay? And then it becomes annoying. I mean, could you imagine if someone was hanging on your on your mouth there and not releasing, you'd get pretty frustrated too. So sometimes what happens though is, say you now take a look at things and you realize, okay, um, so I've maybe, uh, been too much in my horse's mouth or maybe I'm not giving my horse enough release and so you start to give your horse that release well your horse has already learned the habit 
of immediately just, okay, you pull, and then they're immediately saying, oh, yep, she's going to hang in my mouth. Let me root that, that, that mouth out, that nose down, so that I can get away from that pressure. So they've learned that behavior. So we need to break that behavior. Again, I talk a lot about these pattern interrupts. Um, so if you have a horse that's doing that, I recommend one in order to work them through this. If you're not already riding them in either either something like a bow saw um, or a or a simple snaffle, then do so because in order to do what I'm about to tell you to do, you need to do it in either a bow saw or a snaffle to do it one effectively and safely. Okay. So if your horse roots that nose out, what you're going to do, okay, again, one, make sure that you've released the pressure. So you've released the pressure, they have the habit of rooting that nose out, and so they anticipate you're gonna hold, so they just go ahead and root that nose out. You're gonna stick your hands as far forward as possible, right over that pony's neck, and you're gonna pull straight up, okay? And you're gonna really give a jerk. You're gonna pull straight up with those reins. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna lift that pony's head and say, no, 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 no ma'am or no sir, lift that head up for me. Now, this is really important that you do this in a snaffle, or a bow saw because, or, or a bitless because you don't want to have a uh, have a, a shanked bridle or curb where you're pulling up and there's all this leverage because you could literally just shoot your horse through the roof. The idea here isn't to inflict pain on your horse. It's to kind of lift them up and show them this is where I want you to be. And you'll lift them up to as high as you want that nose and head carriage to be. And then immediately, of course, relax that pressure, rub on that pony, let them know that they've done a good job. And when you let them know and you're consistent with that correction, then eventually your horse is going to learn, one, that you're being pretty fair. Because instead of accidentally putting too much pressure on that horse, they're going to say, oh, she's actually not hanging in my mouth. I actually feel comfortable when she draws me to a stop. And two, they'll realize that you have an expectation of them to keep, if you're looking for a level head carriage or if you're looking for a certain head carriage, that you have an expectation for your horse to keep that particular head carriage. And so it'll be a lot more fair and a lot more easy for your horse to understand what it is you're asking for. So I hope that that helps. That was a really good question. Thank you, Jessica. Okay, um, let's see, a couple more have uh, jumped on, so I wanted to say hello to y'all. Uh, we've got uh, Mel from North Texas. Howdy, Mel. We've got uh, Nancy K. Eddie from South Carolina. Good to see you, Nancy. And Nikki Johnson from Texas. Howdy, Nikki. Good to see you. We've got uh, Dawn from Indiana. Uh, Jesse from Georgia. Uh, we have Lisa from Kansas. And uh, Christopher from Florida. Howdy, Christopher. Let's see. We've got uh, Tracy from Minnesota. And we've got Leitner from Georgia. So glad that y'all could join us uh, this evening. Super excited to have y'all jumping on here. Oh, and I see uh, Tammy from Wisconsin just jumped on here too. So good to see you, Tammy. Okay, so I'm going to go back uh, to another question here um, from the group. And this is from uh, Celeste Mares. Okay, so uh, Celeste says, um, I have a navicular horse who is showing great progress. What groundwork exercises do you recommend to keep him in shape? Turning in circles still seems to cause him pain. Okay, so this is a really good question. And, um, you know, uh, dealing with horses with navicular isn't as uncommon as people might see. I, you see a lot of horses that, that have uh, navicular. And, and for the reasons why that is, that's a whole nother, nother issue. Um, but this also is a question that's a little bit above my pay grade. I am not a veterinarian. I am not a certified fairy or anything like that, but I can tell you some of my experiences. Um, so I definitely recommend getting the advice and input from someone knowledgeable like your vet or a farrier that specializes in things like nervicular, corrective shoeing, corrective trimming, et cetera. Uh, but one of the things that you say you already recognize is that with those turns doing the groundwork, which by the way, good, good step that you're starting out with doing the groundwork instead of just jumping on there, right? Um, you want to give um, a chance for that horse to begin to deal with some of that soreness that navicular causes, begin to strengthen that horse's foot, and as that shape, hopefully if, that, if that's being corrected, as that shape of that foot continues to progress and get better, you can gradually build on that, but you don't want to do too much. So like you already noted, 
avoid really small circles, really tight turns, and limit the amount of exercise that you're doing with your horse. If your horse is just traveling off and, and super, super unsound, then you want to make sure that one, with the advice of your, your vet though, but that you're making sure that you're not overworking that horse and causing more strain so that the healing doesn't actually happen. And that's the main thing with things like this when our horses are healing is we've got to be patient. You know, of course you still want to be able to get them exercising, get them moving, get their minds working as well, but of course we don't want to overstrain them. So there are a lot of exercises that while you're waiting for this horse to, in recovery that you can do instead of just actually focusing on getting those feet moving if those feet are pretty sore. So one thing I would work on a lot during this time is flexing, getting your horse to flex. Um, we talk about bending and, and bending is more of a 45 degree turn where you start to turn your horse's nose and make that 45 degree. Flexing, you're coming all the way around and asking that horse to flex. And then also you can work on tipping that horse's nose where you can just pull on that bridle and get them to tip slightly one way or the other. You can do exercises at the walk, like maybe yielding the hind quarter. And if that's too much on the front end, then maybe you can work on moving that shoulder over. But again, doing it nice and light at the walk, seeing how your horse does with that, and then progressing from there. And then of course, you can also use this opportunity to do quite a bit of desensitizing, where your expectation is for your horse to stand still and be relaxed while you're applying pressure and trying to encourage them to be quiet and relaxed and not reactive. So that's what I would recommend um, for you. But again, I can't stress enough, work with your vet, work with your farrier, uh, make sure you guys are on the same page and always put the well-being of obviously of your horse first. Um, don't do too much too soon. Okay, um, let's see, we got a couple more folks that have jumped on. Um, I see Jan from Iowa. Good evening, Jan. And we've got Carol from Tennessee. Uh, Judy, also from Iowa. Howdy, Judy. And we've got Sherry Miracle from Texas. Good evening, Sherry. Good to see you as always. Okay. Um, so I've got another question here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, from Susan, and it says, how do I get my mouthy gelding to be gentle without making him uh, head shy? Okay. So a mouthy gelding, a gelding that, that nips, and this is one of these things that comes up um, quite often where people are asking me, you know, how do I deal with a nipping, biting horse, right? And what's the best way to do it in a way that's fair and not going to cause my horse even more anxiety? Um, a lot of times it comes down to timing, okay? Um, and I know a lot of people are opposed to ever hitting your horse. And I, I agree, you know, this isn't about hitting and beating on your horse but you do have to correct bad and dangerous behaviors. And I strongly believe in that. So it's not about whooping up on your horse, but you'll always hear me a lot of times refer to these pattern interrupts. And being able to break thought processes that your horse is going through is part of having a bond and a real meaningful relationship with your horse. Just like when we have relationships with people, you know, if you see someone that you love and care about and they're going through something and they're going down a, a, a bad path or something, you know, you have a responsibility to at least try to reach out and share and help them through that. And the same is true with our horses because they are our stewards or we are their stewards and we're supposed to take, be good stewards and take care of them. So when your horse goes to biting, you know, that can lead and trickle on into being much worse and terrible things. It can lead to kicking, it can lead, it can even lead to bucking because what's going on is those are bad behaviors that are unchecked, okay? So one thing I recommend is if your horse is biting, first of all, make sure that you are prepared. A lot of times horses don't just bite out of the blue. There are a couple of things that they do before they actually bite. Like they might be too much into your space, right? So unless you've invited your horse in, they shouldn't be close enough that they can bite. And if you know that your horse can bite, then you need to keep them at a distance until they learn better. So again, that comes down to us making sure that we're doing the things to prepare them and set them up to be successful. But by paying attention and recognizing, oh, he's coming 
too far into my space. Oh, look at those ears pinning back. I should back them up and get them out of my space. Okay, so you want to kind of preempt it by getting him out of your space, making him back up, changing the thought from biting to backing up or changing the thought from biting to asking him to move his hind in or asking him to do some lateral work. You're going to, going to again, replace those thoughts with something else. Okay, and then lastly, if that horse does bite you, okay, then what you have to do is I always recommend just kind of catching them off guard. Give them a swift pop underneath the jaw with your hand, and I usually just use the flat of my hand, and I give them a little pop under there, and it's not going to hurt them, but what you're going to do is you're going to startle them, right? Because you know they have a blind spot underneath there, and they're not going to necessarily associate that with your hand, because you don't want to go to their face and laughing at them and beating them. And people do all kinds of crazy, ridiculous things to these horses, like picking up two-by-fours and, and whips and all kinds of stupid stuff, and that's not necessary. But if you can kind of shock them, give them a pop with the flat of your hand, and then immediately draw that hand back because again we don't want to make them head shy and then what's going to happen is when you pop that horse they'll you know they'll freak out like they do a little bit they'll catch them off guard but then they'll look around and be like where the crap did that come from i literally didn't see that coming and it breaks that thought process and they realize oh that wasn't a good idea because there was a repercussion for that bite i believe that if a horse bites kicks those kinds of real super aggressive um, behaviors, they need to be corrected immediately on the spot if you can safely do so without abusing your horse. And by abuse, that means sustained beating on that horse, you know, uh, hitting on that horse to inflict pain. Inflicting pain is not the idea here. It's changing their mindset. When you focus on changing your mindset, those are the changes that last. If you just beat on a horse because you're upset, that's just a temporary reprieve for you, but your horse doesn't really learn anything from that. In fact, like you alluded to, they're more likely to become head shy, less trusting of you, and they're really less likely to be good, safe, steady horses because you're not being a good, safe, steady leader to that horse. So great, great question there. I really, really, really like that question because that's a common question that a lot of people um, ask and deal with. Okay, a um, couple more shout outs. I see a few more of you have jumped on. We see, uh, let's see, uh, Denise. Howdy, Denise. I see Deborah from uh, Nebraska. I see uh, Nanin from Utah. Uh, Valerie from Maryland. Howdy, Valerie. Uh, we've got uh, Annette um, from, I didn't say where you're from, but howdy, Annette. I'm glad that you could join us. And um, uh, we've got uh, Ransom on here. So good to see you this, this evening, Ransom. Okay, um, we're going to, um, I'm just going to get a couple more of these uh, club questions that people have submitted. And then I'm going to go ahead and jump into some of the questions that you guys have submitted this evening um, uh, via Facebook. Again, if you have any questions, now's the time to throw them um, up here. And um, Peter's going to throw them up on the screen for me. I see some coming in, and I'm going to get to as many as I can. Unfortunately, I can't always get to all of them, but of course, I'll try my best. Okay. Um, Kaylee Lynn um, says, my horse is a rescue. She was broke and being ridden in a video I saw before bringing her home, but when I tried to get her, she bucked, or when I tried to get on her, she bucked and threw me off. I can saddle and bridle her. I can put weight in the stirrup. But as soon as I get all the way on, she starts bucking. Do you have any ideas? Oh, Kaylee, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. It's super unfortunate. Um, and it's a shame because I, I see this a lot where people um, buy horses that are represented one way. You take it home and it just isn't um, how it was represented. And it's, it's, a, it's a shame. It's so, so sad. Um, people will do stupid things just to get a quick buck or sell a horse. And, and that's the worst thing because it puts that horse in an unfair situation because you're expecting that horse to do well, catches you off guard, horse, um, his confidence shattered. And then of course, you know, a fall is never, never any fun. So I'm sorry that happened to you. Um, something um, for people to be aware of is just because you see something in a video um, doesn't mean that that horse is gonna do it. So one of the top recommendations I make to people when they're buying a horse, um, is when you go to see that horse, have the owner ride that horse. If they won't climb up on that horse, 
that's your first red flag. Don't climb up on that horse yourself. Have them ride it while you're there. And then, you know, if they say, oh, this horse is good for kids. Well, hey, you got a kid you can throw on there? You know, and if they're like, no, no, my kid can't put them on there uh, and they make up some excuse, that's another red flag, you know. Oh, well, take him out the pen. Can you ride him out the pen? Can you take, if he's a trail horse, can you just take him out and, and ride him down the road, you know? You know, go ahead and kind of ask for a little bit and see if they're comfortable with that horse. And if they are comfortable with that horse and they say, sure, you know, or if they're honest with you with certain things and say, well, they're not so good at this, you know, that tells you that that person is representing that, more likely to be representing that horse accurately. Um, and then the other thing too is a lot of people, I won't say a lot of people, but some people will drug horses as well. And so there's certain things that you can look for. Um, it's not going to cover everything, but you know, if that horse is very lethargic and dropping that head, if they're drooling, um, if you see a gelding and he's dropped, right? Um, those are good signs that maybe they've um, put some drugs in those horses. Another thing too is that, that if these mares have these heavy lips and those lips look a little bit swollen or kind of drooping, that's another sign um, that those horses may have been drugged. So just be very, very careful when you're purchasing horses. Um, there's a lot of shady people in the horse world, unfortunately, but praise God, there's also a lot of awesome people um, too. And so sometimes you'll run into these situations where people kind of take you, um, but don't be discouraged by that because thank God that there are a lot of God-loving, good people who want to do good by their horses and be honest with you and make sure that they're not putting you in a bad situation. So don't be discouraged. And then lastly, I want to address the bucking issue with your horse. Um, go through the desensitizing with her, especially overhead, and then also work on putting weight on the saddle. And so what that might look like if when you put, when you put weight in that saddle, if they buck, what you can do is have somebody kind of hold that horse's head with you as you put weight in, let that horse kind of dance around a little bit and settle down, then step back down off and then step back in there, let her dance around, crow hop or whatever, and then step back off. So make it gradual where you're slowly putting weight over that horse's back, having them deal with it. And these are things that you can do actually without the saddle as well. You don't want to commit and swing that leg over, but you can kind of lay over that horse's wither and neck and hold on, kind of lift up, add a little bit of weight. And again, if that horse starts dancing around, have that second person kind of tip them in a circle so that you can be in a controlled environment where you're less likely to get hurt and gradually get that horse accustomed to dealing with that pressure. And eventually, once that horse can deal with overhead pressure, weight on their back, then you can go back to trying to swing on up over there. Um, but take it nice and slow and gradual and if you're not experienced with doing this kind of stuff or comfortable, then get somebody that is to help you out with the process. Um, that way you're less likely to get hurt because we want to keep you safe. Um, really great question. Thank you for that question, Kaylee. Okay, we've had a couple more folks uh, jump in. I see we've got uh, Lisa McAllister uh, from Arkansas. Howdy, Lisa. Uh, we've got uh, Beth. Good to see you, Beth. Uh, Patricia. Hi, Patricia. We've got uh, Kelly from Maine. And uh, Donna, hey Donna, how are you? Oh, and Alicia, good to see you, Alicia. Good, so I see a bunch of y'all uh, jumping in here. Glad, glad to see everybody this evening. Okay, um, I've got another question here uh, from Teresa. And it says, what are your thoughts on training a horse for hobbles? I would like to be able to allow my boy to graze while trail riding. Okay, this is another one of those questions that seems to be pretty controversial. I see a lot of people with different thoughts on, on hobbles. Um, one thing to know is that hobbles have been used for years successfully with horses. And a lot of people look at hobbles and they immediately scream abuse or you're mistreating that horse. Now, just to be clear, I personally do not use um, hobbles. Um, I, I don't have a need to and um, never have had a desire to control my horse's feet in that way. However, um, I do do soft rope training where I'll put a soft rope around my horses, get them giving, standing still, that kind of thing. And um, if I have a client that wants a horse to be prepared for hobbles, that's the kind of work that I do so that my horse doesn't panic when their feet are restricted, okay? And that's a super important 
important talent to treat teach your horse or skill i guess to teach your horse so that your horse if they get into a bind say they get hung up in a fence um say they get wrapped up in a vine or some logs that they're not just going to panic and freak out and i've i've seen that where horses have gotten in a bind and they've freaked out and it's caused a wreck i've also seen other horses that have been trained using the soft rope method where they get into a bind and they step into a branch or something or a vine or whatever and they don't panic they stop and they take a deep breath and they lower their head and they wait for that rider to climb down and help get them out of that situation so whether you're a believer in hobbles or not there is some benefit to training your horses how to handle hobbles um, and so it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis with each person, whether you use them or not. Um, and I can't make a re recommendation for or, or, or against, um, but what I can tell you is I don't see anything wrong with people who decide to use it and use them properly and prepare their horse to use them, right? You don't want to just throw a pair of hobbles on your horse um, because that could be detrimental and you could have a blow-up, that horse could end up getting hurt. It's something you need to be... Um, thoughtful, mindful for, prepare for, and get somebody with a little bit of experience that can help you with the process of preparing them for that if you've never done it yourself before. Um, great, great question. Thank you for that question. Really, really good question. Okay, um, last, um, I'm going to do one more question um, from the club members, and then I'm going to jump right into some of these um, questions that you guys have thrown up here uh, this evening on Facebook. So um, this one's from Michelle Barnhouse, and she says, I purchased a foal this week, and I am looking for guidance on working with him until he is weaned. I want to work him as much as able so he is a good citizen. Now that's great. You know, um, it's, it's so cool because when you have a foal, you're so excited, and you've got the whole, whole future and life ahead of them, right? And, and it's so awesome to watch these little horses grow and mature, and we want to make sure we set them up to do well, kind of like uh, Michelle's alluding. To getting him to be a really good pony, right? And so one of the things that I want to encourage you to do, Michelle, is just make sure you're gradual with him. You don't want to burn him out and add too much pressure or too much training or focusing on the schooling, but you do want to give him a little bit of discipline and direction. When I say discipline, a little bit of a, a routine, a little bit of regimen where he gets used to doing certain things. And it can be as simple as not even touching your horse. You can just go out in there and herd him, like drive him from this side of the field to that side of the field, or drive him from this side of the pin to that side of the pin. All of those, and, and again, just like with everything else, you're going to add pressure, remove pressure. <sighs> Take a deep breath to let him know he's done a good job. Even without touching him, you can begin to train and teach him how to give to pressure and how to be a pony that works with people in a good way and you'll be able to set him up to be more likely to do better. Um, you can even do all of the essential ground maneuvers um, that we do. You can do that with foals. The key though is to take it nice and quiet and slow, be gradual in the process and make sure that you don't overwork these little foals. You know, um, their attention span is very limited and their minds are, fra are fragile. You can burn them out pretty quickly. So when you're working with, with foals, I always recommend to limit at first, you know, five to 10 minutes, you know, um, and, and getting them kind of uh, gradually, uh, gradually used to, to being able to pay attention and, and concentrate. And then you can work it up to maybe 20 or, 20 or so minutes, um, but not too much. And always making sure that you set them up for success. Um, if you are a club, and then Michelle, I think you might be a club member, make sure you check out the uh, Unbreakable Bond um, series because all of that Unbreakable Bond um, work you can do with a foal. You can do that. Um, get that that foal in a round pin. You can start to work on, on, on those exercises in a gradual way. So um, that's definitely what I recommend. Take your time, be gradual, and make sure you set um, your little follow-up to, to be successful, and I'm sure you guys are going to do awesome. Okay, great. So um, we've had a couple more folks jump on. I want to make sure I tell you guys um, hello, and if I missed you, I'm so sorry. Some of these uh, names just fly across so quickly, and I don't, I don't get them all. And then we're going to jump into some of your Facebook um, questions that you guys have posted. 
Uh, so let's see. Uh, we've got uh, Sandy. Howdy, Sandy. Glad you could jump on. Uh, Claire, always good to see you, Claire. And uh, Tammy, howdy, Tammy. And let's see, we got Tina from Florida. Welcome, Tina. Glad you could jump on this evening. Okay, so uh, let's see. I've got a question here um, from uh, Ransom Reed, and he says, uh, can a hot temperament horse cool down, or are they wired that way and always be spooky and white-eyed? Oh, that's a really good question. And, you know, I get that question a lot where people will see a horse that's just, I mean, fractious, anxious, you know, lots of energy all over the place. And they'll, they'll ask me inevitably, they'll be like, you know, can, can this horse be fixed or will it get any better? Is this just in this horse's uh, nature? And the answer to that is your horse can always make progress. Always. I don't care what anybody tells you. You know, people will tell you things like, oh, this horse, you know, this is just, this horse is just honor. Or this horse will always be like that. Or this horse will always, be. no, not at all. Your horses can always make progress if you're willing to be patient and willing to put the time in. Okay. So it doesn't mean that that horse will make progress from zero to 60 overnight. Okay. What it means is that you might have to put a little bit um, more time, a little bit more effort and the most important thing is to be gradual. And you guys, I, I know I, I must sound like a, a broken record because I talk about being gradual with your horses all the time, but I cannot impress upon you how important that is and how that changes your relationship with your horse because that's what it all comes down to is your relationship. When you have a good relationship with your horse, when your horse trusts you and trusts your lead, then they're more likely to listen to what you're asking them to do when you're communicating it clearly. So if you have a hot horse, make sure you work on some of the transitions that we do when we're sending our horse and when we're doing some of the unbreakable bond exercises, when we're trying to do those transitions from the walk to the trot to the canter, you know, and just to kind of walk through that. When I ask my horse, say I'm in a round pin and I ask my horse to trot on that round pin, okay? I want to be able to get my horse to transition from a trot to a walk by simply just taking a deep breath and drawing down the pressure. And there's some people that look at, look at that and might look at certain horses and say, no, no, you can't do that with my horse. My horse is just too hot. But you put that horse in a round pen with me and I'll start working that horse. And the thing is, it's not on my time frame. I'm gonna let that horse work itself and let them move around until they become, begin to become comfortable with me. But until they begin to believe that I really have their interest at heart. And once they get to that point, once I take that deep breath and give them the opportunity to slow down to a walk, well, then they're so ready and willing to take it because they know that I'm going to be fair and good with them. So I just want to encourage you with these horses that are a little bit harder that can sometimes be um, a little discouraging. Just keep at it. Slow down. Take your time and look at things through your horse's um, perspective, and you'll get there um, with that horse. Just look for a little bit of progress each time um, you work with them. And uh, I promise you that you're going to eventually make leaps and bounds. Great question, uh, Ransom. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, Christy Brown says, how do I know if the bit is the right one and fits correctly? That's a, that's a good question. Um, when it comes to bits, um, for the most part, I always recommend most people – to ride their horses in a simple snaffle. And it could be an O-ring or a D-ring, that's fine. But I always recommend a simple snaffle. Um, most horses, in my experience, most of the horses that I come across and work with, they don't have the hours, years on them um, training to be ridden in a curb bit, okay? And just to be clear, a snaffle is a bit without leverage, okay? Um, so uh, when you put one pound of pressure on a snaffle, that horse is feeling one pound of pressure. Now, a curb bit is a leveraged bit. That's a bit that has a shank on it. So if I put one pound of pressure on a curb bit, um, that might end up translating into 15 pounds, 20 pounds, depending on the type of bit that's in that horse's mouth. So for, especially for beginners, um, for horses that are green, horses that haven't had more advanced training, I recommend just using a simple snaffle so that when you say, hey, come this way, it means come this way. 
Instead of come this way, and that horse freaks out and that head gets high, the back gets hollow, um, they end up getting bruising in their mouth. I definitely recommend starting with a simple snaffle, making sure on the ground that that horse knows how to give to that pressure, uh, and then translating that into your riding. Um, being slow, being gradual, being soft, being fair with the way that you handle it. And especially if you're new to horses, I recommend getting some horseback riding instruction where someone can teach you how to properly and gently use your hands with that bit that you're using. But um, when all else fails, I recommend um, a snaffle with most horses. As far as fit is concerned, um, you don't want to have that bit where it's uh, where the sides are scrunching up in the corner of that horse's mouth. So you want to look for a good anywhere from about an eighth to a quarter of inch space on either side of the corner of the mouth. That tells you that it's not going to rub. Now, on the other hand, you don't want to have so much space um, that it's going to be sliding back and forth and rubbing that way. So you don't want anything more than about a quarter of an inch give on either side um, when that bit's resting in the corner of your horse's um, mouth. And then as far as contact in the corner of your horse's mouth, that's going to vary from discipline to discipline. But as a rule of thumb, just barely sitting up against the corner of the mouth is a good place to be. Um, some people talk about putting a half or a wrinkle in there, um, depending on discipline. Um, but um, as a good just overall rule of thumb, just setting up, just barely making contact where it's touching the corner of the mouth, but not necessarily making pressure on the corner of the mouth. That's going to be a good um, safe bet for you to fit that horse's um, bit. So hope that answers uh, your questions there. Really good questions there. Thank you. Okay, um, we've had a couple more folks jump on. Um, we've got uh, Marge from Maine. Howdy, Marge. We've got Irene. Uh, we've got uh, Allison and uh, also Lily has jumped on. So good to see y'all uh, this evening. Okay. Um, Patricia Jackson says, how can I get my girl to stand still for me to get in the saddle? Oh, I like this one. This is a common issue. In fact, um, I had somebody um, write me about this uh, just a week or two ago um, via email. And um, this horse was backing up, you know, when she went to climb on. And so I told her, if that horse backs up when you go to climb on, just start backing that horse up all over the arena. Just tell her, okay, you want to back? We're not going to make this a cute thing. We're just going to back, 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 back. Then let that horse stand still. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Go ahead, step in. If the horse starts to move, then go back to moving that horse. When they stop moving, put that foot back in. Let them rest while your foot's in the stirrup. You know, make stepping into the saddle a good thing for that horse, an opportunity for that horse to rest and stand still. So you can do it through backing, you can do it through sending your horse. They start moving, you say, oh, that's a mistake. You're gonna have to do more work now since you started moving. I'm gonna ask you to, to send out, you know, work them at a walk, work them at a trot, work them at a canter, bring them on around, then take a deep breath, put a foot in there, and don't even necessarily just step up there yet. Just let your foot rest in there, take a deep breath, let them kind of stand there, recognizing that when you put a foot in that saddle, that's a great thing because that means they get to stand still, rest, and relax. And we know that our horses tend to be a little bit lazy at times, so when we let them rest and relax, they're more inclined and more likely to be still and quiet for us. So um, that's what I would recommend um, there. Make sure that you're persistent and patient with it. Um, it seems counterintuitive. People will tell you things like, don't cheat that, don't let that horse cheat you. You know, don't let that horse walk off. And I'm, and I'm telling you the opposite. Let the, no, don't only let the horse walk off. Make the horse walk off. Make him move out and then give him the opportunity to stand still, nice, quiet, and relaxed. Great, great question there. Okay, let's see. Um, uh, do, do, do. Uh, Leitner says, uh, when I go in the pasture, my herd comes to greet me. Um, fine, I enjoy it and tell each one. I'm sorry. So the, this is posted up with a, let's see. Okay, so I'm, I'm missing parts of this question. But it says, but when I go to walk off, they don't want to give me room. They seem to push each other off to get attention, but then the kick fest starts. How do I stop that? Okay, so this is kind of come broken up with me when it was transferred over. Um, but basically, 
um, it's saying that basically when you go to the pasture, you know, all these horses come up and they want to see you and then they start kicking and carrying around you. And that can be a very dangerous thing. Um, there's a couple things that lead to this. One, if you go out into your pasture and you're accustomed to treating your horses or feeding them out of your hand or being around them, then what happens is when you go out into the pasture, they aren't really coming to see you. They're coming for a treat or they're coming for whatever that reward is that they expect to see. And we all know that when ho too many horses get around one feed source, they become very aggressive very quickly. And that's just the nature of horses. That's part of their survival instinct. So one, one thing, especially if you have a lot of horses, it's not a good idea to just go up in between them and start treating them. And I can't tell you how many times I see this happen. And I see people doing this. And, you know, they think that they're being kind and loving to the horses. But what they're doing is they're really setting their horse up to fail because what's going to happen is one horse is going to hit another horse, kick another horse, or pin their ears out back at another horse, and those horses are going to come slamming into you. They might knock you down, break an arm, dislocate your shoulder, step on you, and then you're upset, you're mad at the horse, but really you put that horse in that situation. So you don't want to just go out and pass your horses and start handing out treats. You. That way you can kind of shoo them off and say, hey, step away, and make sure you're adamant. When you say step away, that means they need to start packing in the other direction. And if they don't, you know, hit the ground with that stick, get after them, give them a tap on the hind and say, come on, get out of here. When I say go, you got to go. And so they have to get in the habit of listening and respecting your space instead of just crowding you and coming and putting you in a vulnerable situation. But the key is being very clear with your communication and your expectation. You can't be wishy-washy here. You know, you can't be shoving a treat down their mouth one second and then cracking the rip whip the next second. You gotta make sure you establish very clear boundaries. Um, one thing um, with my horses that I like to do, if I'm going to catch one of my horses, I call that horse's name when I'm going to catch that horse. And so, you know, maybe the first couple of times that they're by themselves, I might take a treat and give them to that horse and then I will walk away. I'm not going to hang out there. And then the expectation is for that horse to draw in. Now, if that horse draws in too close to me, I will send them off. You know, I don't want you that close to me. You know, I just want you to follow me, but I don't want you in my hip pocket where you can compromise my safety. And so eventually over time, my horse learns that one, when I call their name, that I'm calling them, right? And two, they begin to recognize, okay, I'm going to come, but I'm also going to respect their space. And then you can get to the point too, when you go to call out your horses from the herd, that you can call one horse or two horses or whichever horses you want specifically from your herd. It takes time and repetition, but the key thing is to be consistent in the way that you ask, and, and you, you can get there with your horses too as well. Okay, um, let's see here. I've got uh, another question here from, and from uh, Valerie uh, McKay, and it says, I've started riding a young horse that does great on the trails with other horses, but when alone, tends to refuse going certain directions, like in the woods. What can I do? So it says uh, she rides great on the trails with other horses, but when she's alone, um, it sounds like she lacks confidence. So one of the things that you can do is we want to transfer that horse's confidence to other horses to you, right? And one way that you can do that, the easiest, quickest way, is by doing certain exercises on the ground to establish that leadership and that trust with you. Um, let me give you a good example. This might seem unrelated, but I promise you it is. Um, uh, just uh, the other night, I was working with a carriage driver and their horse, um, and this horse drives commercially, uh, commercially downtown, very busy, busy city, you know, San Antonio, Texas. And that horse uh, wouldn't step over manhole covers, okay? Um, so, you know, the, the horse is going over and see a manhole cover, and they would just divert and, and skirt around. And so I was explaining to that driver, you know, it, it, it's not that the horse necessarily is afraid of the manhole cover. Really, the horse doesn't trust you, okay? And so, and again, going back to this horse that won't ride towards the woods, that horse doesn't trust you enough, okay? And so what, what I did is we found, and it, it happened to rain that evening, we found this huge puddle of water. 
And I said, here's what we're going to do. I want you to take this horse um, through that water. And I'm going to stand back, and you do, you know, what you would normally do to take your horse through this type of obstacle. And so um, she did a great job. You know, she, she took the horse, oriented the horse towards the water. You know, the horse started balking, started backing up. She added a little bit of pressure behind, kissing, clucking at the horse. The moment the horse took one step, she quit cutting. Quit clucking, quit kissing, right? She'd say, good boy, you know? And then she'd go back to asking for a little bit more. And eventually she got that horse to go through that water. And think about that, because when that horse sees that water on the road, that horse doesn't know how deep the water is, doesn't know if there's a snake in there, doesn't know if there's a foot trap in there. That horse has to trust his driver, okay? So she put her through the water. Then we turn down the road and say, okay, now take that horse and I want you to take her over some of the, take him over some of these, uh, these manhole covers. Believe it or not, immediately that horse started crossing every single manhole cover. He wasn't afraid that the manhole covers were going to eat him because she had worked him through that. And just in that moment of doing that exercise through the water, they created a bond, a bond that was based and built on trust. And so to bring it back to your horse that doesn't want to go uh, through the woods, that's what we want to work on. We want to do exercises on the ground, you know, send him over tarps, send him through water obstacles on the ground, okay? Or, and then when he's doing good on the ground, do it under saddle. Find little easy things that you can get him to go through so that he begins to trust that no matter where you ask him to go, that's a good place for him to go. And when he believes that you have his best interest at heart, that's when you guys truly are going to be more bonded and he's going to trust you more and be so much more likely to be your steady mount for you. So I want you to find some exercises, look at doing some obstacles with him, find little things that you can do to slowly build his confidence in you. And I promise you, you're going to have a much more confident, much more steady horse. Great, great question. Thank you so, so much for all these questions. Um, this evening. You guys have really given us some good questions this evening, and I'm always so grateful for all of y'all jumping on here, contributing, and I can't express enough how grateful I am for the community that you guys have built here. You guys are all friendly and loving and encouraging to each other, and this is always a safe place where people can ask questions and give input and grow with each other, and I'm happy to do that alongside with everyone here. Um, a couple more shout outs to some of y'all that have jumped on and in, in a moment, uh, gonna go ahead and do our Facebook uh, live giveaway here and um, we'll do that in just a second. But I wanted to make sure I said hi to Marge that jumped on here, Tiffany from Michigan, uh, Alicia from, uh, Alicia in Hondo, good to see you Alicia. And of course, Stephen Smith, glad to see you and Debbie German from California. And uh, let's see, Shannon Rojas as well jumping on in there. I'm so glad to have y'all on um, this evening and glad that you guys could all join us. Okay, so let's go right to the uh, weekly giveaway prize. Uh, this week is, it's an I Heart My Steady Horse t-shirt. I totally love those t-shirts because um, we all love our horses, right? And we're super proud of them. Um, and so let me go, let me go ahead and, and punch in. And the criteria here was, uh, for entering was to post a photo of you loving on your horse and my goodness i saw some some awesome photos um really really good photos and i just love that everybody is just so loving and compassionate and and that people really take good care of their of their horses um, and your horses your horses love you for that let me tell you okay so i'm gonna punch it in here and here it goes it's rolling through and it's ticking 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 and we have a winner. I'm going to do a little drum roll here. And congratulations to Lisa McAllister and her horse, Venus. So congratulations, uh, Lisa. Um, what I'd like you to do, Lisa, is um, email your shipping info to me at noah at steadyhorse.com. And Peter will get that sent um, right out to you. So just email me your shipping info, um, put in the subject line that you won the giveaway, um, Lisa. And again, Peter will get that, uh, that t-shirt out to you. Listen, everybody, I am so grateful to everyone getting together uh, this evening. It's always, always my pleasure um, to share with y'all. And um, so, again, I can't express enough how grateful I am for all of the Steady Horse family and everything everybody 
does to make this truly, I believe, the absolute best training resource on earth. Hope y'all have a beautiful rest of your evening.